Great. Good morning, everyone. Hi from New York City. Um, our next speaker, uh, as Joe mentioned, is from Columbia. She is a National Geographic Explorer and had an enviable first job working at a zoo. She was trained as an architect and a landscape architect. And during her time in, at the zoo, she met cotton top uh, tamarins for the first time, a very distinguished and adorable looking monkey. I hope we'll see lots of pictures. And she was so impressed by this an animal that she was inspired to want to learn more about their habitat and the threats facing it in the tropical dry forests in Northern Colombia. She then joined Proyecto Titi and now leads efforts to secure this wonderful area filled with biodiversity. We will be doing a few questions afterwards. So as they occur to you, please drop those in the chat and we'll get to them. Rosamira, thank you so much for being here. I'll hand it off to you and join you at the end. Thank you. Hello to everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us to uh, share our stories and let's get right to it. I will share my screen. And there we go. Here's the object of my love and my passion, the very cute little cotton top tamarind. Uh, this is their home. It's the tropical dry forest in northern Colombia. Just a really amazing place where this little one pound monkey lives. And even though they're little, there's a lot of similarities to us humans. So they live in family groups, just like we do, mom, dad, and the kids. Uh, they're very territorial, so just like us, you know, you we don't welcome unwanted visitors to our home. Uh, they don't either. The babies, which are born in pairs once a year, learn everything from their parents and from the adults, or every adult in the family. Everybody helps care for the babies, just like we do. And they have a very distinct diet. You can see them eating, chubbing on some weird insect there and uh, sucking on, on sap that comes out of the trees, but mostly they eat fruits that grow from uh, the forest where they live. And there's always somebody watching out to keep everybody safe. And mommy is usually the one that has like the lead for where to go, where to sleep, what to eat, and especially how to care for each other and stay safe. So lots of similarities uh, to us humans, uh, you could say, regardless of the size difference. But something very special about this little monkey is that it's only found in Colombia. You don't find it in the wild anywhere else. And even within the country, you can see in the map of Colombia, just that black blob in the north region of Colombia, that's the only place on earth where you find cotton top tamarinds. So that makes them really, really special especially for us Colombians. It's our responsibility to care for this little monkey. But unfortunately, challenges are many, uh, mostly related to habitat loss. So uh, the traditional activities like cattle ranching, agriculture, really have put a you know, hold on protecting the forest, you can see in the images, but also local communities that log the largest trees to sell the wood or to use them for domestic uses, such as firewood or fencing or fixing their homes when they have issues. And then another thing that um, it really affects cotton tops is the illegal pet trade. Uh, they're so beautiful with their, you know, white chocolate hair and their charisma. People think they're, it's cool to have, uh, to have them as pets. So there is a, an illegal traffic going on, mostly within our country. It used to be internationally as well in the past, but that is really putting cotton tops in, in danger. And that is why it, this is a, a species that is considered critically endangered. That is one step away from being extinct in the wild. This is it. So we have about 7,000 left, but the forest that is left is very little. It's less than 8%. And about a third of that, it's only what's good that has forest that has food and shelter for these little monkeys. So they are in very critical condition. And that is what we do at Proyecto DD. This is the project that I lead. And our purpose, our sole purpose, is to guarantee a long-term future for this very cute little uh, monkey that it's um, only Colombian. And for that, we have four pillars that you see in this image. 
which is a, you know, we have tried to put together an integrated um, conservation model that tackles every one of the threats from a different angle so that way we could be more effective. So I'll tell you a little bit about, um, about what we do in, in the forest. And, and then, you know, I, I can take your questions at the end. But this is the place, the places where we work. And you can see in the map, which is a part of, of the distribution area of cotton tufts, those little green dots, that's all we have out of forest. So we're focusing on work where there's like clusters of forest, and we're doing there all of our you know, conservation programs and, and try to save what there is in there uh, until we have more time to grow the forest and just try to find the balance between the needs of people and the needs of wildlife, especially the cotton tops. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about our research work, which is how the project started more than 35 years ago, actually, uh, a great uh, woman, Dr. Ann Savage from the U.S., came to Colombia to study these monkeys in the wild, not speaking a word of Spanish. <laughs> Still a mystery how she did it. But she said the basis of all of what we do now. And she's another, you know, a trailblazer for sure. Uh, but we used to uh, telemetry to track the monkeys. You see daddy here with a little backpack. Uh, and that is how we are able to track the animals in the wild because this is a one pound monkey that hangs out 30 to 40 feet above the ground. So it's not easy to see them. And on top of that, they don't like humans because they get hunted for the pet trade. But this way we're able to find them every day. And our team, Francie and Felix here, go in and take notes and learn everything there is to know, what they eat, how they interact, when they take a nap, uh, when they reproduce. It's like a soap opera that you follow every day and just kind of uh, record all those stories. And that's how we know so much about cotton tops. We have for 30 years, more than 30 years, studying the species in the wild and in captivity as well. So now we know a lot about the monkeys. And the amazing thing is we can use all of that knowledge to conserve the animal, to help their conservation. So this is how we do it. We follow groups every day and learn a lot from them. And we use all that information also to do population surveys. That's how, that's how we know that there's about 7,000 left in the wild. We have done two population surveys and we're actually getting ready to do a third one next year when COVID um, allows after 10 years. And it's gonna be very interesting to see how all of our efforts have contributed to more forest and more monkeys. So fingers crossed for that. But there's a the huge science base in everything that we do in the field to study the animals and to use that for conservation. But we are aware that the main threat is the forest. So my personal mission has been to work hard with environmental authorities on one side to protect whatever's left, those little green blobs, we're making a huge effort to protect those and then make sure that at least we have that protected to start with. And to that, we have been able to protect 5,400 um, hectares, working with environmental authorities in creating public protected areas. But we have also created our own, and this has been you know, one of my dreams come true, to have a, a, a reserve where we can work, track monkeys and protect wildlife that is actually neighbor of a thousand uh, hectare national park. So we're extending the area that is specifically for the animals. And we're very proud of this beautiful forest that we're saving for the monkeys and, and for all wildlife for that matter. But we cannot do these things alone. And uh, we also have a third strategy that is working with local farmers. You see this crazy map here with lots of colors. And what, what it is, is it's like a spider web of uh, forest corridors that we're planting so that uh, cotton tops can move around from one forest fragment to another because they never come down to the ground. So connectivity is very important. And we're doing this with the farmers within their land. We would love to be able to buy, you know, all the land in the world to protect it for wildlife, but it's not, it's not a real alternative. So we're working with farmers. They're setting aside corridors. We plant those corridors. We have a beautiful nursery where we propagate seeds that we collect from the trees, plant these trees, grow them, mark them, and then plant them in the corridors uh, of the farmer's land. And then we monitor their growth and their survival. So that way we can build slowly because it takes a while and we have to be patient. We're building forests for the monkeys and for wildlife 
one tree at a time. So far, we've planted like 100,000 trees in the last uh, three years, and we're protecting like probably uh, 250 more hectares of forest for the monkeys. This is what we want to see. We want to see the little monkeys be able to move around, find food, find territory, find new mates whenever they need. And for that, we need large trees and connected corridors. And this is something that we're leading with the work in the communities as well. And we know that we are always talk about cotton tops because this is the species we love and we work to protect. But saving the forest for the monkeys, we're saving the forest for all these amazing wildlife species that live in Colombia, and especially the birds and, and lots of mammals that are part of our huge biodiversity. So we focus on cotton tops, but the impact is really wider than that. And not only the animals, saving forests, we all know that provides a safe uh, water source for people. Look at these kids, you know, enjoying uh, the rain. And, and we know water is just crucial to us. Um, and then, you know, we also have resources, food and wood, if we use it sustainably, which is what we want. So trying to find that balance between saving the forest and research and the animal, we have two great programs that touch directly on our communities. And one of them also works with a bunch of amazing women, also trailblazers, leaders from the local communities that make these beautiful bags. Guess what they're made of? Recycled plastic bags. We collect them before they you know, go into the streams to litter or the forest or the lakes and create so much pollution that is created by plastic bags. And they crochet these beautiful bags and make what we call the eco mochilas. And the fun thing is they can do that while they are at home. They can chit chat, and watch a soap opera and just do their life, but be productive. And with that generate an income for their families. Because people that use forest resources, they do it because they need to support their families. They need to feed their families. With this, we're given an alternative. And look at these beautiful bags that are already in the runway of many prestigious designers here in Colombia, which is amazing. And also in the shelves of fashion uh, stores where they're starting to combine plastic bags with other materials to make these beautiful, fashionable plastic bags. But what do I only do bags? There's another group of, of friends in, in the community, also leaders and ferocious women working uh, to make these amazing plush toys. Uh, they laugh a lot, they have fun, and they send the message out with these little plush toys. Yeah, you want a cotton top? Here's one. Just buy this one. You're helping the communities, you're helping cotton tops, helping the forest, and you uh, learn that this animal needs to be in the forest and not in our homes. We also work with the farmers. Most of some of them are, uh, you know, within the same families. Uh, they get an income for helping us plant these trees that we plant every year on the rainy season, and they also get, uh, you know, income by helping us transport these little plants because some of these places are not reachable, not even in a motorcycle, even less a truck. So we need to go, use the good old bull roads that are used in our local communities for transportation. And that's also opportunities to uh, create an income and work with the family, not only with the females, but we, because we know that uh, it's a, it's different social groups, but um, we're working with, the, with their relatives in the farmers, which are the ones that plant uh, the, the, the land, uh, the farm, and then we're getting everybody involved. And all together as a family, we started offering the opportunity for people, audiences to come and see our work, our social work and our research work. Unfortunately, we are on hold now because of COVID, but it's an amazing experience to see the monkeys and then talk to the people that are helping protect the monkeys, especially these this amazing women in the local communities. And working with them has been great because you know, everything they receive, they invest in their own family, in their homes. And that has been a, a, a great learned lesson that motivates us to continue this uh, approach of involving the family, but women especially because of their impact in their own families. What we want from this uh, community work is stories like Mr. Hector Barrios, who in his parcel found a little cotton top that had fallen from a tree. It's a baby girl. In other situations, he probably would have sold it or would have kept it as a pet. 
but he's committed to the conservation agreements they signed to work all together to protect the forest. He called us and we were very successful, able to return this little baby to her family next week using vocalizations uh, pre-recorded and sending, you know, calling the family and they came in and, and get the, got the little baby and took it and took it with their family. So this is a success story from a family in the field that starts, you know, understanding that animals need to be in the forest and that they are very important in getting this message out. So we're very proud of that. And of course, the the future generations of Colombians and little kids, we have a whole set of programs for kids um, that start in elementary school, understanding the differences between wild animals and domestic animals. And then they learn to train their dogs as a way to strengthen their relationship with their domestic animals and discourage wanting to have a cool monkey with, you know, white rock hair uh, as a pet. Then in secondary school, they have a longer program, semester program, where they learn more about cutting tops and how can they help. They actually go to the forest and all of the stories in the booklet, they bring to life in the forest. And that is where we go straight to the heart for these uh, kids and get them really engaged. Just having a happy day in the forest. These images, of course, are pre-COVID, <laughs> but and we're looking forward to taking the kids back to the, to the forest when it's safe to do so. But they have a great day. They see the monkeys. They see lots of wildlife. And they understand that they have a very important role in protecting their natural resources. And then we have stories like some of these kids, they just don't want to leave. They want to continue involved. And this is Rosa. Rosa is one of our teachers now who teaches other kids in her community uh, about cut and touch, but she went through all of those programs and now is one of our leaders in, in our community. And we're very proud of her and, and appreciate her commitment. And like Rosa, we have, you know, a group of very committed young individuals that we're sure are going to be the best ambassadors of our work. We celebrate the day of the cotton top again this year. We had to do it virtually. Looking forward to meeting with communities again and celebrating to, to cotton tops and life by doing what we do, what we love to do, dance, music, poetry, art. And what a great way to connect people with nature and with their own culture by uh, instilling value on a little monkey that it's only found in Colombia and that needs our help to survive making it fun, going to the heart, creating those you know, special connections between what makes you proud of, uh, of your country and of your biodiversity, and also you know, addressing the needs of people that uh, just wanna make a decent living and provide for their families. And here I wanna highlight our team. You see a lot of uh, uh, trailblazers here. And uh, we're basically half and half a very diverse team that uh, it's 100% in the field, uh, making all of these programs work and uh, in making sure that everybody falls in love with cotton tops, just as we are all in love with this cute little monkey. Thank you very much. Here's our social media and our website if you want to um, see more of our work, see great images and videos of cotton tops and follow us and learn and support our work. All of that uh, eco mochilas and plush toys, you can also purchase online on our website. So thank you so much for listening and I would we'll be happy to answer any questions if there's time. Rosamira, thank you so much. Um, lots of comments about how cute the monkeys are. <laughs> 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 thank, you. Um, thank you, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> Protecting biodiversity is such important work. Even if some of us never directly visit these places, they offer our imagination so much. Yes. Um, so primates and monkeys are, of course, highly intelligent and clever. Someone was wondering if they ever try to remove their tracking backpacks. No, it, we, we were very careful to design this way to carry the backpacks. So that is, as you saw in some of the pictures and mommies, carry the babies in the back for 10 weeks at least until until they're able to walk on their own. So having something on, on their back, it's common. It's it's very, they're used to it. And, and we have never in 30 some years of studying seen any, any cases of that. Besides, they're very light. 
So they're like 10% of the weight of one uh, of the babies that they carry in the back. So we made sure that it was something uh, that uh, was healthy for them and it didn't, it wasn't disruptive at all for uh, their day-to-day activities. And someone asking uh, what kind of foods do they like to eat? And maybe does that differ when people keep them versus what they're foraging? They eat fruits from the forest. Nothing like we eat at home. It's fruits, but it's different fruits. Fruits that are, that grow in the forest, they're usually very uh, little. And we have tasted quite a few of them, and they're mostly sweet. So <laughs> these guys are like a sweet thing, like we love chocolate or candy. <laughs> but the great thing about that, um, them, them eating, their diet is probably more than half of their diet is fruits from the forest. And it's more than... 60 different species of fruits. So when they eat those fruits, they swallow the whole fruit and then poop the seed. And that seed comes out ready to germinate. And new trees come in the in the, the ground uh, of the forest because of cotton tops moving around and pooping quite a few times a day. <laughs> but that is actually one of their ecological roles in, in the forest. They're seed dispersers. And, um, and they also pollinate because they suck on the nectar of flowers. And with the little hair here, it gets the pollen gets stuck, and then they go to another flower and help. They just help the balance of the forest and just keep that equilibrium. So yeah, they're very uh, sweet tooths. And for protein, they do insects and also sap from the trees, which gives them a lot of energy, especially on the dry on the dry season. Even their their poop plays an important role in the ecology. Yes. And I'm yes. sure you're learning about all of these interactions and in the web of life and in that sphere. And because there is so much biodiversity, are you ever surprised at things that you're finding out about the ecology there, interactions that you perhaps didn't know about or species that you hadn't been to? Mm-hmm. No, it's amazing to, I mean, to go into the forest and our team that goes into the forest every day. And again, that's their office. Can you imagine having a forest for an office? (laughs) And in 30 years plus of studies, of course, we've learned a lot about cotton tops, but it never ceases to amaze us because we go to a different place and we saw some variations of of their behavior. And it it is all all depending on on the context, on on what they have available. And I think the fun thing is, the, the most fun thing is to see how similar it is to us, how they, you know, moms kind of like, you know, ground their kids or they yeah. demand them to behave or they just, you know, pull their hair and say, quiet, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just fun and, and just to see the, the similarities. And of course, seeing other wildlife is just amazing. We see, you know, it's, it's a huge biodiverse forest and we see all sorts of little creatures, big creatures, you know, spider, mon- and spider monkeys, howler monkeys, uh, uh, sloth bears, uh, lots of little, you know, uh, ants and, 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 and snakes and birds, gosh, macaws, which are my second favorite, of course, not first favorite, it's cotton tops. But yeah, it is amazing. And for the kids, when they go into the forest, it, that's, that's when we did say, leave. look at this. Isn't it worth to save this? And, and you can do it. You can help us out. And actually, the story of the poop is the one that the kids in our education programs remember the most. <laughs> they just get it, you know, how important it is for, for wildlife. Of course, and and we had a, a couple of concerned uh, audience members wondering more about the hunting that happens and what we can do about it. Well, um, I think all of us as citizens of the world can just you know strongly reject anything that has to do with the illegal traffic. You know, in our case in Colombia, we encourage kids and people in our audiences to not purchase cotton tops for pets, to not support any activity that is related to hunting cotton tops and keeping them as pets. That's for our specific work. But you got, I mean, around the world, and I know there's an audience from many places in the world, there's issues all over the place. And you can just reject that and make sure that your day-to-day life supports conservation in many ways. Whatever you purchase, whatever you use, the kind of waste that you generate, you can just be sensitive about that. Learn, inform yourself, read, and just reject that. And, and never accept that and get your family involved, get your friends involved, get your coworkers involved. And, and you know, you sometimes you feel like, you, you know, one person doesn't make a difference. Yes, we do make a difference. 
it doesn't matter how little this is. It, I really encourage you to just one friend that you convince not to have any exotic animals as pets or, you know, purchase things that damage the elephants in Africa or the monkeys in South America or the bisons in North America. You know, it, it's all, it's all, all over the place, we can do something about it. So I encourage you to do that. Just read, inform, learn, and just make a difference and make changes in your life. And I appreciate you bringing that up and distilling those links is so important and getting the education and realizing how all of us can do our part to make the planet a better place for all the other species we share it with. I'll leave you with one last question. You touched on a little bit. Um, lots of people wondering for um, being conservation minded, how they might prepare themselves for a career to help wildlife. Perhaps you have a few examples of earlier experiences that set you on your path. Listen, yeah, I, I am I'm, I'm a weirdo <laughs> in a way that, you know, when I started life, I had I had something else in mind. I trained as an architect with a landscape architect. I loved nature. But look at where life brought me. And, and it was just because I felt really passionate about, uh, about, you know, making things right and finding balance between nature and humans. I think what took me to here was that experience on, you know, eye to eye with cotton tops at the zoo for the first time on my first landscape architecture job. But if you like it, if you feel passionate about nature, read, uh, learn, inform, and just uh, uh, learn about the challenges and, and, and try to set solutions for it. There's a lot of people working around the world, and you will see that at this event. Lots of women also pushing for, you know, many social and environmental causes. And, and it is because you feel the passion. That's the first thing. And, and you love what you do, and you can dedicate 100% of your life to this. But you need to understand. You need to read. You need to learn. And, and organizations like ours can provide you that information now with social media. It's all there for you to look, to review, to learn, and to ask questions anytime for us to communicate with you. And But if you feel that passion, go for it because the world needs more people, more you know, trailblazers, more women working hard, and more humans, after all, just you know, being sensitive and, and just chipping in for protecting our, our nature and our natural resources and our wildlife and cotton tops. You can purchase the cotton tops online as well and help us out as well. <laughs> An adorable way that we can all hang out with them. Rosemary, <laughs> thank you so much for your important work and for being with us today. And everybody, please check out uh, her organization and the social media links that she shared earlier on. We'll put them in the chat as well. Thank you for being thank with you. us. Thank you.